Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I'm Jason. I work uh, at Lyft on the mapping team, and I'm going to be presenting some uh, some of the work that a lot of people have been contributing to at Lyft over the last couple of years. So as a rideshare company, we process billions of ETAs con almost continuously. Um, and we, we need to have really low latency and really high availability on these ETAs. And the company has always done this. This is what we need to do to match riders and drivers. Um, so even before we embarked on any kind of mapping product, um, we already had routing services, GPS and location services, um, and ETA services. And uh, we found that um, you could have really accurate ETAs if you had a strong route prior, if you knew the route up front that a driver was going to take, you can have a really accurate ETA. Um, so we noticed that we have a lot of the ingredients to build a navigation uh, app. And we thought, hey, maybe we can do more if we actually brought navigation in-house. And so we, that's exactly what we did. And today, through LiftMap, uh, we make it easier to be a driver than ever. We offer specialty features, such as building highlights uh, when you approach a pickup or drop off, uh, contextualization, where we show traffic, um, or why a, a driver might be stopped on the road to the rider. Um, we give the driver speeding alerts. And then drivers really love that they can uh, see the map in their infotainment system and have really large touch targets and have all of that integrated in a really large screen. We also uh, work on things like specialty pickup and drop off points. You'll see this in the animation on the left. Um, we actually offer multiple uh, drop off points um, that are based on you know, what we know is actually happening on, you know, in the real world. And on the right is us dropping somebody off at the front of a building instead of at the parking garage, which a more general consumer map might care about. So when we embarked on this, uh, we evaluated several base maps in 2020. And we thought that OSM was ready. And the reasons were uh, it had a pretty good core road network with a lot of the key things you care about, good, good uh, connectivity of the road network graph, reasonable geometry. A lot of things like turn restrictions were OK. And we thought we could incrementally improve them. Um, there's a large active community with a lot of uh, mapping experts. And so that was really useful to leverage. We also found that there are also a lot of commercial uh, companies using OpenStreetMap. And we could col like softly collaborate with them through the map. And some of them are working on the same things we care about, like gated communities. And then there's a thriving ecosystem of tools um, for processing change sets. Um, there's a great talk on OSM Cha just earlier. Um, and all of that has been really amazing. And one of the key things about OSM that really we found to be an advantage was we could respond to customers much more quickly if we could edit the map ourselves and bring that into our product uh, right away. And that was a key advantage um, for us. So we had this observation that we could continuously improve this map. And so from day one, we built a system that was really meant for continuous and incremental map making. So um, because of the time that we started on this, uh, we, didn't, we didn't really take a kind of like build the map from, you know, big squares or big patches like from scratch, but rather how can we just continuously edit? And so the way this works is we have raw data sources, imagery, GPS telemetry, and also information from our uh, navigation client, whether our driver is following a route. And we use that to detect map errors in an active way uh, continuously. And then um, we will either use that to automate some, some map layers that don't go to OSM, or uh, send that to a curation team that will then uh, task those things and push them to OSM. And then we push that to our product, we get feedback, and the cycle continues. So in the rest of this talk, I just want to talk about some of the interesting technologies we built to make this happen. Um, so it'll be a little bit of a potpourri. So I mentioned raw data sources. So one of the things that we do is we deploy a number of cameras to every market. Um, we did this in a really kind of quick and dirty way by deploying cell phones to uh, drivers' vehicles. And those once they're uh, installed, they're completely passive. There's no interaction with them. Um, we control those devices completely. Um, and what they do is they capture uh, forward-facing imagery at a relatively uh, slow frame rate. And they also run object detectors on the device and detect you know, 
mostly signage, but some road furniture and some other things like that. Um, and so we detect continuously, and then uh, we have an upload policy that says, is, is our imagery fresh enough on this road? And if it is not, we'll upload all the imagery for that road. Or we may have an upload policy that says, have we seen this sign before? Um, do we need to get a new capture of this sign? And we'll choose to upload it. So there's kind of a dynamic upload policy. Um, and we've deployed nationwide in everywhere that we operate, as well as some cities in Canada now. And we've generated a lot of data. On the right is kind of a heat map of, it's not exactly a heat map. This is our coverage um, with green being fresher and yellow, orange being less fresh. We see about, um, for every road that we capture, we see about half of that market every two weeks again in the vehicle um, for the number of devices we've deployed. And then we can dynamically upload, in theory, like imagery that's very, very fresh. Once we have those detections, um, what's depicted here is kind of the blue dots are where the vehicle was when we made the detection. Um, and then we, or sorry, that's the, that's the map match dots. Those are the orange dots. The blue dots are where we projected the sign location to be for each of those independent images. And then we just kind of aggregate and get a candidate. So that red dot is where we think there was this turn restriction sign. Um, and then in order to figure out whether there's a map error, we need to somehow associate that with the intersection that that traffic control controls. And to do that, um, we've, we've done this in a number of ways, but I thought this would be the most interesting to talk about. So uh, we have this somewhat novel way of doing uh, what I call, would call data fusion. So we create this composite image that's almost like a visual image of, of all of the data that we have. So it's, you can think of it as pixels. Um, and one layer will be the road network. One layer will be the candidate locations of different you know, signs that we think exist. One layer might be detections and the vehicle heading at the time of capture. Um, and another layer will be different statistics around the GPS telemetry, so like speed traversals and other things in kind of like a custom visualization. And we just sandwich all those things together and create an image. And as a person, if you looked at that image, you might actually know what's going on in that intersection. And that's exactly what we ask this uh, convolutional neural net to do. We ask it the question, um, is there a sign at the intersection in this particular direction? And that's what the training data looks like, and that's kind of the, what the, detect, what the uh, classifier does. Um, and this actually allowed us to push our precision recall curves really up and to the right compared to kind of the typical naive way to combine all these different sources of data through rules and, and logic. Um, and so for some layers, we are able to automate you know, upwards of 80 or 90% of the layer. And for OSM uh, edits, we're able to very effectively find uh, errors and then send it to one of our curators to then push to OSM. Um, we also, this is super reusable, so for any kind of signage layer, we're able to just kind of create, create these images as training data and then uh, put it in the system and, and get like a great detector out, which is great, like it's a lot less custom work. Um, but you don't always know that you wanna make a layer, so we also built a tool around uh, what I call like an instant map that gives you a rapid prototype map layer. So in this, in this case, what we did was we took the imagery and we, uh, we indexed it with really rich features that you can query in natural language. So you can imagine like clip features, for instance. And when you type a natural language query like speed bump, um, we'll, do, you know, we'll do like a vector lookup and find all images that might have that speed bump, uh, you know, that, that match with that, um, that vector, and, uh, and then we bring those up on a map. And so on the left, you can see speed bump and the different kinds of signs that it finds for that. And you can, there's like a little slider, and you can kind of choose how, you know, how well you want to match. And on the right, um, the query that I have is stop painted on the street. And you can see it actually brings up examples of the words stop painted on the street. And you can type in words painted on the street, and it will just bring up arbitrary words painted on the street. So it's, it's pretty magical for very rapid product development, um, testing things out before we want to make a, a real layer. Um, but you know, this would just be a jump off point. You would not want to ship this to production uh, or into, into OSM. And then we also do some automation around place data. Um, so one thing that we are able to do is see when uh, folks search for things, uh, type queries, 
um, but do not actually find the thing they're looking for. Um, so we can aggregate those queries, put them into a web crawler, and find uh, public uh, public pages for businesses um, that you know post information. And then we can extract that information using LLMs. We actually score the page based on its like likelihood of being useful to us, and then um, extract uh, you know information like the address or the type of business that it is. And we pre-fill the tool, and then curators can move extremely fast to build these POIs, which has given us tremendous speed ups as well. So um, I mentioned a couple of times that we send things to curators. Uh, one of the things that we've also built is a custom curation platform that manages the work that we send. And I'm just going to highlight, it has a lot of really interesting features, um, but I'm going to highlight two of the things I think are most interesting here. One is um, from day one, we built in this state machine, the ability to have quality control. So especially in the very beginning when we were first getting our uh, you know, feet wet with OSM, we wanted to be able to curate every single change that, that was being created before it went to OSM. And we still use this today for, o for OSM in particular where, um, and especially with new curators, uh, curators will come, they will make the change. We hold out kind of a mock change set internally and then it is shown to a QCer who can then um, edit that or uh, not really edit it, but leave feedback on it. And if it's wrong, it will go back to the original curator and they'll fix it. And once the QCer says that it is good, they'll just click push or you know um, thumbs up or whatever, and it will go to OSM at that point. And so we have some logic to prevent co internal conflicts so that we're not just clobbering ourselves in OSM. But basically, everything we put into OSM has at least been seen by two people. And then. Also, since this whole system is made to be very uh, continuous and um, you know, we assume there's a stream of edits that are never ending, uh, we built a system that um, kind of manages ha like working with that kind of uh, information. So a big piece of our tasking manager is that it's claim-based. Curators don't get to choose what work they're working on. Operations managers don't get to really choose what work uh, the work curators are working on. They just click next and they're given work that is the best thing for them to do at that time. And the way it works is every task has priority and confidence and like a number of other factors that can be used, like how, how likely is it that we drive by that area a lot, things like that. Um, and then every project is given a budget. Um, and then also there's different kinds of projects like quotas or stream projects that have an infinite number of tasks. Um, and every worker has qualifications. And so given all of this, uh, basically what the system is doing is it's load balancing the work um, continuously. It's always optimizing to um, you know, chew through those different projects with their different budgets and quotas or SLAs, um, given like a fixed worker pool, fixed amount of resources, and, and op kind of somewhat optimize. So you can think of um, from the perspective of writing a new detector to find map errors, we can just keep writing detectors and throwing things into the system. And given however much we staff it on one side, we will just optimally chew through whatever tasks are available, um, which really means there's almost no management um, other than managing the people, which is more fun. Once you're in the tool, there's this amazing uh, uh, kind of map tool we've built um, that, of course, just like, just like Rapid and, and other tools you're familiar with, of course, you can composite lots of different tile layers. Um, but also, it has a plugin architecture for just building kind of little mini apps on top of. So that lets us, um, that lets us uh, build custom editing tools for very specific kinds of tasks where we don't show you the capability to edit everything. We just let you edit very specific aspects of a task. Um, it also allows us to build things like guidance debuggers and kind of advanced tooling for just debugging all any, any aspect of our system, ETAs, things like that. And it's a very cool tool. Um, all of the modules inside can share data with each other very efficiently, so everything loads very fast. Um, and Igor is here at the conference. If you want to learn more about this, go find him. I think he's next door, but he'll be around after this talk. And, uh, and yeah, so we, we love OpenStreetMap. We've, we're, we're getting close to uh, half a million OSM edits. Um, we engage with the community all the time. 
um, around schema and tagging and things like that. Um, and we look forward to hopefully contributing more to the map and maybe tools and other things in the future. Um, and this, the navigation we built on top of this is our primary way for uh, getting drivers around. So I think we're running out of time, but um, yeah, what's been great is the, uh, the community and the flexibility of, of OpenStreetMap. What's been hard is the flexibility of OpenStreetMap. Um, you know, there's always tags that are deprecated or in some, in some halfway state, which is typical in software. Road network segments have non-standard lengths, which can be hard for real-time data. And um, the geometry is really good from a connectivity standpoint, but not always great in like really large intersections or between dual carriageways and single roads. So that's it. And I'm, you can ask me questions later. I'll be here. Uh, till tomorrow, so.